Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to starting HPV vaccination at age nine. We're so thrilled to have all of you with us today as we ring in HPV Vaccine Week in California. So it's an extra special uh, moment to celebrate with all of you. Thank you for your work and advocacy, and we're excited to share our agenda today. So very quickly, just to orient everybody to what we'll be speaking about today, we'll do a very quick overview of uh, our partners and where this webinar came from. And then we'll get right into uh, a special message from the Office of our Surgeon General. And then we'll get right into our future presentation from Dr. Debbie Saslow of the American Cancer Society on why age nine matters for HPV vaccination. And then toward the end of our program, we'll get some updates from California's HPV vaccination roundtable, of which I'm a member as well. And so we'll hear some updates from that group on uh, different data updates, as well as materials you can use this week. And then we'll close and we will just make sure everybody here has a chance to evaluate, give your feedback and walk away with some actionable items. So thank you again for being with us. I just want to take a moment to uh, thank and, and mention the partners that have worked to produce this uh, webinar today. So our first is our primary host is the California Immunization Coalition, which is a 501c3. I think many of you on the call may have gotten this inv invite from CIC. Uh, you know they're absolutely wonderful nonprofit. The public-private partnership dedicated to achieving and maintaining full immunization protection for all Californians. So thanks CIC for your leadership in putting this together. Another key uh, host and uh, partner in this event is the American Cancer Society and especially uh, the California chapter of the American Cancer Society. As many of you know, the mission of ACS is to improve the lives of people with cancer and their families through advocacy, research, and patient support, and to ensure everyone has an opportunity to protect, detect, treat, and survive cancer. And that includes, of course, HPV vaccination. And finally, the California HPV Vaccination Roundtable. This is a partnered effort between ACS in California and the California Department of Public Health. This coalition uh, is seeking a future where uh, HPV cancers can be eliminated through um, uptake of the HPV vaccine, timely uptake, and reaching our goal of 80% of full vaccination by uh, 2030. And all of you are probably Zoom pros, but we just want to remind everybody, um, everyone's in listen-only mode, but you can communicate with us through uh, Q&A. If you have any technical issues during the webinar, there is a dedicated link that's in the chat. So please refer to that link if you're anything that sounds strange or anything's uh, not working well for you, you can refer to that link. So please, uh, you'll, you'll hear the audio through um, the listen only mode. And so we do request that if you do have questions that you want to submit, and we would love your questions, we really want to get them to our presenters, please use the Q&A function. Uh, you'll see it pointed out there on the screen, you should see it in the toolbar below. So please just submit your questions through the Q&A. That way we won't miss them and do our best to answer them all in real time. So thanks for that. And I'll just take a moment quickly to introduce myself. My name is Margot Stackbavich. My pronouns are she, her. I'm the Community Outreach and Engagement Coordinator at uh, UC San Diego Morse Cancer Center. And I'm also a member of the California HPV Vaccination Roundtable. I'm one of the co-chairs of the Parent Community Work Group. So thanks for being with me today. And I will just quickly uh, highlight for all of you, we are so thrilled. This has been a, a several um, months in the making to work together with the Office of the Surgeon General uh, to have just in time for California HPV Vaccine Week, a very special message from Dr. Diana Ramos about the HPV vaccine. So please hear this message now. Hello, I'm Dr. Diana Ramos, California Surgeon General. And I wanna share an important cancer prevention message. The human papillomavirus or HPV causes at least six types of cancers, including cancer of the cervix and the throat. The good news is that the HPV vaccine can prevent these cancers. The HPV vaccine protects both men and women against the most dangerous strains of HPV. By the time they are young adults, most people have been infected by HPV. The vaccine works best when given between the ages of nine to 14, as recommended. 
but can be administered up to age 45. The vaccine is safe, long lasting, and effective. You can help us make California HPV cancer free by getting vaccinated. Don't leave cancer up to chance. Book the shot for yourself or a loved one. Talk to your doctor or pharmacist or head to findahealthcenter.hrsa.gov to find the closest HPV vaccine provider for your family. So a huge thank you to the Office of the Surgeon General and Dr. Diana Ramos for making uh, using her, her power and her platform to lend visibility to such an important issue in California and for California pub public health. So a big thank you to her for um, making that in time for this week to celebrate with all of us. And so I'd like to now introduce today's featured speaker, Dr. Debbie Saslow. So Dr. Debbie Saslow is the Strategic Director of Screening and Vaccination at the American Cancer Society. For over 25 years, Dr. Saslow has served as the ACS subject matter expert for HPV-related cancers. She is responsible for developing and updating ACS guidelines, including guidelines for cervical cancer screening and for HPV vaccination. Dr. Saslow has also served as the tri-chair of the National HPV Vaccination Roundtable since its inception in 2014 and the tri-chair of the National Roundtable on Cervical Cancer since its launch in 2022. And I'll just say um, from myself and so many of us on this call working on HPV vaccination, thanks, Dr. Saslow. Your work has been a real North Star for so many of us. So um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. That's so great to hear. Thank you. I'm happy to be back with you virtually. Um, and I'm going to talk to you for a little bit about age nine. And great that um, your Surgeon General says that uh, HPV is most effective starting at age nine. I wholeheartedly agree. All right, so here's our guidelines. Um, this is from the American Cancer Society. Hopefully you all know all of this. Um, but just as a quick refresher, all boys and all girls should get vaccinated to protect them against HPV cancers. On time, vaccination is considered age nine to 12. Um, and late is any time after that. That doesn't mean you shouldn't get it late, but if you can, um, get that vaccine on time because it's gonna prevent more cancers. Um, after somewhere around the age of 18, uh, the effectiveness against cancer drops very, very, very steeply. Um, so by the time you reach adulthood, yes, you can get vaccinated, but the likelihood of it um, providing any protection is exceedingly small. We're talking like 1%. Um, and so um, if you're a provider and you have an adult um, looking to get vaccinated, that's great. Go ahead and vaccinate them if they want to, but just let them know that uh, protection, you know, they should limit their expectations. We certainly don't want adults who get vaccinated and then who may get an HPV uh, precancer or cancer to think that it was because the vaccine didn't work. Uh, an advantage of vaccinating on time, in addition to obviously protecting the most cancers, is um, only two doses are needed if that first dose is given before the 15th birthday. After that, three doses are needed. And so here's um, one of a few data slides that I'm gonna show you. This is from Sweden, where almost the entire country uh, got vaccinated, at least the women um, starting during the clinical trials. And so you can see this is almost 2 million women um, in that age uh, 10 to 30 uh, group. And out of um, the unvaccinated group, you can see that's the orange line, um, what kind of cervical in, uh, cancer incidence they had. The green line is vaccination on time. So it says that this is age um, 10 to 16, but almost everybody was vaccinated around age 11 or 12. Um, they had really good adherence to vaccinating on time. And you see out of almost half a million uh, women who were vaccinated on time, there were only two cases of cancer. And then um, out of the 90,000 who were vaccinated between ages 17 and 30, and again, almost all of these were close to age 17 or 18, they had, okay, so that's 
one fifth as many people had eight to nine times as many cancers. Um, so you can see just how much the effectiveness against cancer prevention goes down when you go from on time to just a little bit late. Um, on time vaccination, 88% protection against invasive cervical cancer. And this was the earlier version of the vaccine. This is not the current version that protects against um, more types. So this was really exciting to see the benefit of um, on uh, actual cancer prevention. Before that, we had HPV infection protection, we had general warts, we had pre-cancer. Now, finally, this was the first uh, demonstration of cancer prevention and also exciting to see that, yep, we got it right when we said vaccinate um, preteens and, uh, and even a little bit before that. Um, and this just breaks it, the age down a little bit further. So this is out of, the, um, out of England and the United Kingdom uh, where they were able to see um, a child who was vaccinated at age 12 or 13, who then came in for screening in their early 20s. They had 87% protection against cancer and 97% against precancer, uh, advanced precancer. Um, and again, this is with the earlier version of the vaccine. So this was striking just waiting a year or two later. So still within that Surgeon General recommendation of by 15 or 14, I think she said, but waiting until 14 to 16, that effectiveness drops by about a third. And again, another third by 16 to 18. So here you can see um, what happens with the effectiveness of the vaccine. And I know one of the questions that people sent in was, um, you know, about vaccinating on time and what if what if parents aren't ready on time. Um, if I were an MD, which I'm not, but um, I am a mom, um, and my kid said to me or my patient said to me, really don't want this vaccine. Can't can't I wait? Well, as a mom and as a, for you as a provider, would you prefer to protect these children against 90% of cancers or 30% of cancers? Uh, to me, that's an easy decision to make. Um, and so we are seeing this study after study after study. Because I'm talking about age nine, I'll tell you that when this study was done, they didn't have the, uh, the data yet to go below age 12. So every couple of years we get new data and it gets younger and younger um, because the kids who were vaccinated at age nine, 10, 11 are just now aging into their twenties when they would start to get screened. Um, and then it takes a couple of years to um, analyze and publish the data. Okay. so. Why, if you can't tell I'm excited about age nine, you're not listening very closely, but why? Why am I so excited about age nine? And I'm gonna go through nine of the benefits uh, pretty quickly. So one is you have an extra couple of years compared to starting at age 11 to complete the series by age 13. Um, and it's much, more kids go to the doctor at a younger age than an older age. So this is pretty significant. Uh, results in a strong immune response. So younger kids have a stronger immune response than um, older teens and adults. Increase the likelihood of vaccinating prior to first HPV exposure. Yes, nobody, nobody wants to think about 11, 12, 13 year olds having sex. Um, occasionally that does happen, it's a small percent, but also not all sex unfortunately is consensual. So why not just give that vaccine um, before any potential exposure to HPV? Decreases questions about sexual activity by parents and guardians. We don't like to think that parents care how this um, type of cancer is transmitted through this virus, but unfortunately they do read Facebook, they do read social media, and that, that's a big uh, issue that is um, found um, on social media. And so, yeah, some parents do come in, it's not uncommon, particularly for an 11, a 12, a 13 year old uh, child, their mom may say, hey, you know, sexual activity, my kid's not sexually active yet, Kids do not want their parents talking to their doctor in front of them about whether or not they're sexually active. Um, and for some interesting reason, um, unknown to me, the parents of nine and 10 year olds, they don't ask. 
it's just not on their radar yet. And somehow by age 11, 12, it is. Um, so that's great for kids, parents, and doctors to not have to talk about sex. Um, the benefits um, also decrease requests for those vaccines that are required for school. Um, so in California, I'm sure you know, there's it differs state by state of why a state determines and how they determine which vaccine should be required for school. And it's, it's based on policy and it's based on all sorts of things, not due to the safety or effectiveness of a vaccine. Uh, but we are stuck with the fact that at age 11, 12, uh, most kids in most states either are required to get the Tdap vaccine and or the meningococcal uh, conjugate vaccine uh, for middle school, and only a few states also require HPV. And so if a parent's coming in with an 11 or 12 year old, they may say, only want the shots that are required for school. They will walk out of your office. The children are protected against Tdap and meningococcal, but not HPV. If the HPV vaccine is offered at age nine, second dose at age 10, you're done uh, by 11 and 12. And so again, not an issue. Uh, this is probably the most important uh, or highest impact reason or benefit for vaccinating at age nine. It decreases the number of shots per visit. Now, we in public health may think, uh, no big deal. You know, you get three shots in a visit, four shots, five shots, it's safe. Um, you know, get over it. <laughs> but um, believe it or not, most parents, one shot per arm and that's it. They're done with their kid. Most kids, they don't want more than two shots in one day. Um, and the you know, providers are gonna go along with what the, the parent says. And so again, get that first HPV dose at age nine, second one at age 10. And then when they're 11 and 12, they've got Tdap meninge. They may also have flu. They may also have COVID. So you know, we know that if there's one shot out of all of them, that's not gonna be given in a visit, it's gonna be HPV. So age nine really is gonna up the chances of protecting these kids against six types of cancer. Okay, so I showed you that it's a lot more effective at cancer prevention to, um, to vaccinate at age 12 compared to age 14, compared to age 16. There's not that much higher protection that you can go below age 12, um, as far as, you know, 97%, 90%, not going to get that much higher. But keep in mind, this vaccine, any vaccine is only going to be effective if it gets into the arm of a child. And so it's not that vaccinating a nine-year-old is more effective at, than vaccinating an 11 or 12-year-old. It's more effective at preventing cancer because it's more likely to get into the arm. Because as I've been saying, an 11 or 12 year old is more likely to leave their doctor's office being protected against other diseases and not HPV. And so let's get more vaccines to more arms so that we can prevent more cancers. Number eight, we have the evidence and I'm gonna show you some of that evidence um, that systems that offer vaccination routinely starting at age nine have higher vaccination rates than systems that do not. And who doesn't want higher vaccination rates? And a ninth benefit is that it's shown to be highly acceptable, not just to the health system, but also to the provider, the parent, and the patient. So man, win-win. Now, Anyone who comes with a, a science background or who reads an article in a scientific journal knows that if you talk about the benefits, you also have to talk about the limitations. So what are the downsides of vaccinating at age nine? And here they are for you. I have done my duty as a scientist and I have shown you the downsides. There are none. The only potential downside is that vaccination, uh, the protection wanes over time um, because we want to make sure that our kids are protected well into their 20s when they're still gonna get a lot of exposure to HPV. However, HPV vaccination has shown no, zero waning over time. Therefore, no downsides, no harms, no risks, just do it. All right, what about this evidence? I want to see the evidence um, for 
you know, don't just take my, my word for it. So what the National HPV Vaccination Roundtable did is they put a call out to papers. We have about four or five papers um, as of 2019, 2018, 2020, when both AAP and the American Cancer Society updated our guidelines to routinely start at age nine. And, you know, it was pretty good data, but we wanted more. The public wanted more. The providers were demanding more. And so we put out a call for papers and now we have about 20 of them. Um, in addition to the original four or five, these 20 papers are all in this um, special issue of uh, human vaccines and immunotherapeutics. Um, and you can go to the um, HPV Roundtable TV or YouTube channel and see this is an example of just one of the video abstracts from one of those papers. And these papers run the gamut. They're all over the country. Uh, they are descriptive. They are um, special populations. They are looking at um, analysis of NAS teen um, all over. Um, and it's a great collection of articles. And you can, um, again, just take a quick peek at um, these video abstracts that the authors have so kindly done for us. Some of the findings include an increase of up to 30 percentage points in on-time completion rates. When I see a lot of studies in the literature that claim success in increasing the rates of HPV vaccination, they're usually on the order of three to 5%. And here we have 30 percentage points in, in a year. It's incredible. A large increase in those with public versus private insurance and those with access barriers. So the kids we most want to reach are the ones getting the biggest increases, the biggest bang for the buck by routinely offering HPV vaccine at age nine and very high acceptance, as I mentioned, by providers and clinics. Um, so just increasing the evidence base um, that we have. So if, if there are skeptics among you or among your colleagues or that contact you, um, direct them to uh, this special issue. The most common question that I have heard about you know, not so sure about whether to offer at age nine. Um, the, the big question is, okay, well, this sort of goes against what CDC says and what the ACIP recommends. Not true. Since 2007, the ACIP has said, and I quote, recommend routine vaccination at age 11, 12, or starting at age nine. They haven't gone back and looked at this since 2007. They've had other things to do, like look at COVID vaccination, um, and they don't really see this as a problem, and they really heavily invested, um, particularly CDC, in promoting an adolescent platform of a bundled message. So if you've been around for a few years or 10 or 20 like I have, um, you know that the recommendation, all those trainings were 11 and 12-year-olds. Just tell their parents, we recommend strongly that your child get vaccinated today against Tdap, HPV, and meningococcal. Okay, well, the problem is that that doesn't work. If it works for you, great, keep doing it. We are not saying to stop doing what's working. The problem is that in most cases, it's not working. In most cases, your state and county and local rates of HPV vaccination are lower than your rates for Tdap and meninge, which are steadily around 90%, whereas HPV is somewhere between 60 and 70%. So um, if you wanna get your HPV vaccine rates up, give this a try, can't hurt. We have a lot of resources to help you do this. We have the HPV Roundtable Resource Library on uh, hpvroundtable.org. Um, it has so many resources. We've had to clean them out because there were so many, it was hard to navigate. So really we've only kept the ones from the last couple of years. And by the way, if you have resources that you want listed in the National Roundtable Resource Library, go ahead um, and go there. There's a place right here to um, submit a resource but we have a whole area just for age nine. We have posters, we have flyers, we have handouts. 
we have on to the next slide. We have a whole social media campaign with all these pretty pictures that you can repost. New York State is going wild this week. Uh, their Department of Health just officially um, endorsed age nine and they are sharing all of the age nine resources. It's exciting to see. Um, we have more and more and more resources. We have all the evidence, we have checklists, we have reminder cards, we have cue cards for your staff. We have this amazing video that's like one minute long on nine for nine, which are basically um, the nine reasons that I just gave you. Um, and we have the, the journal supplement with the 20 papers and more um, that I mentioned, as well as the uh, video abstracts. Here are some of those video abstracts. They're all in a playlist on the Roundtable YouTube site. Um, and hopefully um, you'll either get a copy of these slides or as follow up to this webinar, um, you'll get the links that are um, listed in these slides. Um, so what do I want you to do? Normalize HPV vaccination. Everybody's doing it. This is to prevent cancer, present it as a cancer prevention vaccine and routinely offer it at age nine. Uh, here are those benefits that I listed all in one slide. I'm not going to go through them again, but again, I will um, focus your attention on if you have to remember just one, remember number six, because this is the one, the number of shots that resonates. And we have a lot of data um, that Merck, who manufactures the HPV vaccine, have provided on how many parents choose to get one vaccine in a visit, two, three, four. And there's not that many that want three or more. And hopefully I'll have time for questions. So thank you. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Saslow. Uh, a really fantastic presentation. And I, I hope that that really helps to anyone, like you said, was sort of on the fence or feeling a little bit of I need more, I need more encouragement and I need more data to really go ahead and implement that strategy. Hopefully that was the final piece for you to, to decide to go ahead and to try to adopt some of these strategies. Um, I want to just quickly take a moment to encourage anyone who may have a question to submit it if you haven't already, but thanks to those who already have, we've got several, uh, several questions uh, going in the Q&A so I can begin with our first one, actually. So for Dr. Saslow, uh, do you recommend individuals to get a vaccine if they are unsure if they've had it in the past? Uh, huh. I'd like to say yes. And before they do that, they should try to find out if, you know, if they have a medical home, there should be a record. Um, the They may be able to, to find out um, through either school records or through the state immunization registry, because you know it's not going to hurt to get extra doses, but why get them if you don't need them? Right. Yes. Yeah, so we would encourage folks to, and there are state registry. You know, if you're in California, there is a California. Um, we have Care Two, which is our immunization registry too, which might be also help you capture whether or not you've had that dose. So, uh, thanks for that. Let's see, so moving down to, so this, this is a, a pairing off of the comment about the ACIP recommendations for 11, 12, and, and 9. So one of the other considerations is that this does not currently align with um, NC, NCQA HEDIS measure metrics. So is there advocacy happening to change the HEDIS measure? So actually it does align because um, I helped with the HEDIS metric. And um, unless they've changed it, which I don't think they have, the HEDIS metric is by the 13th birthday. It has nothing to do with when it starts. So this will help you get to HEDIS because you're, um, for the HEDIS measure, in addition to by the 13th birthday, it also bundled Tdap, meninge, and HPV. So if your practice and you're reporting your HEDIS measure and you have 88% of your kids got Tdap, 85% got meninge and 50% got um, all of their doses of HPV, guess what your HEDIS measure is? 50%. They don't care about 
Tdap and Meninge, they care about all three put together. So if you vaccinate at nine and 10, you're gonna raise that HPV rate up and meet your HEDIS metric. Thank you for clarifying that. Hopefully that helps um, in internal conversations, maybe some of you are having too, to get this implemented. Now, there are actually several questions around, and I don't know if it might be something you could pull up the slide again one more time, but we've got a couple of questions about the difference in efficacy or protection versus from vaccinating earlier versus later. So one of the questions is specifically about 18 plus, um, but the question's looking at, you know, could you repeat the percent of protection for adults sure. receiving it late? And then the, a parallel question, what, do you, is there, could we comment on why the protection drops off in older ages? Sure. Um, so the protection um, for on-time vaccination is about 90%. The protection for that 14 to 16 year old is about 60, 65%. And I think it's the next slide um, up. And then the protection for the um, late teens is about 30%. So you can see how drastically it goes down. Uh, when we looked at, um, they harmonized the protection for boys from age, it used to be 21 and the girls were 26 and they made everyone 26. And so they did a whole bunch of modeling. Um, the protection for the 21 to 26 year old is very low. And for the 27 to 45 year old, which is um, based on shared decision-making with an asterisk next to it, not quite shared decision-making, but if a patient asks for it, that's where it's, uh, 0.3 to 0.5%. So I'm not saying don't get it. I'm saying as a public health question, 0. 0.3 to 0.5% benefit, that's not, to me, that doesn't make public health sense. That doesn't mean if somebody says they really want the vaccine that they shouldn't be able to get it. And it is covered by insurance um, because it is recommended by ACIP for people who ask for it. Thanks for that. And I'm just working through a couple more questions here. Uh, there's a question about, we've got some California specific questions that maybe some of us can take who work more closely to California immunization. Just looking through a question, I'm jumping back up. Uh, your comment about, um, you know, not all, not all exposures are by choice. Is there any discussion happening at the national roundtable about in incorporating that message into communication tools, maybe internally facing for providers, or is that something that is sort of by case by case basis, whether to mention that the, that the topic of um, that not all exposures to HPV are by choice or consensual? I'm sorry, can you repeat that briefly? I was answering the question about NCQ. Oh, right? yes. oh no problem. Um, <laughs> is there, uh, you had mentioned the, one of the rationales, right, for nine is that not all exposure to HPV is by, is consensual or by choice. Right. Is there um, discussion among kind of public health leaders about including that messaging point into more external communication tools, or is that something that's more kind of case by case, you know, knowing the family, um, just yeah, curious. Yeah, you know, and I, so, so the answer is no, um, we're not planning to. And I also saw a question about um, the abuse in the materials. Um, and I think that was <laughs> referring to the CDC immunization schedule, which they did update. They've updated each of the last two years because we've been banging our heads against their wall um, so that they've given us a, a special um, uh, stipulated pink color in there because there were providers uh, earlier, the poster said it was, it implied that it was only, only give it young if you suspect abuse. So um, now they've updated that. 
Um, and the reason um, I say, um, no, we're not gonna include this in our, in our materials is because we're having, we, we have spent so long, 20 years now, um, trying to not talk about sexual transmission and HPV. This is about cancer prevention. There is no other vaccine where we talk about how the disease is transmitted. We don't say, get your baby a tetanus shot because they look like a kid who's gonna grow up and step on rusty needles. Or we don't say get your infants a hepatitis shot because your baby looks like one who's gonna eat feces out of his diaper. Okay, we just don't do it. It doesn't matter. We wanna prevent cancer. And you don't, you don't offer the HPV vaccine to a kid who looks like they might be sexually abused or they might go out and be promiscuous as a 10 year old. You give it to all nine year olds, just like you tell every one of your kids and your patients to put on a bike helmet before they get on the bike and not in the middle of their bike trip. You tell all your kids to put their seatbelt on when they start their car and not as they're approaching a busy intersection. Just do it. Awesome. And you've actually preempted, I think, some of the answers to questions that were submitted earlier about, look, you know, what's the, what, what to say to parents about who are afraid that will there be a relationship between the vaccine and that behavior. So I think you've you've answered that very clearly uh, in the comment there as well, right? This is about cancer prevention. Um, we've got a question. There's a couple of questions about hesitancy or um, strategies for making an argument, and it might be kind of adapting some of the things you've shared in the presentation. But um, if you might share, you know. Some of the some of the comments or some of the experiences that you've had or or learned from clinical partners, strategies for overcoming parent hesitancy in the moment, overcoming ambivalence in the moment from parents. Yeah. So we, you know, this is the most one of the most popular topics that people want to hear about, and we do have several recorded webinars. I think there was a set of three just in the last few months um, on H the HPV Roundtable um, website. I'm pretty sure that we did that in collaboration with the St. Jude um, Prevention Program, as well as with the American Cancer Society. Um, and so um, some of the more effective strategies, you know, you start, you, you swallow your own thoughts, you bite your tongue, and you start with compassion, right? these parents have seen horror stories on Facebook or Twitter or wherever it is. They want to protect their kids. We want to protect their kids. If you're a pediatrician, you want to protect the kids. So you start there. You ask them, you know, you just ask them for permission to talk to them about it. Ask them what their concern is. Do not talk to them about every other concern that every other parent might have had, because now you're just going to add to their concerns. And remember that most questions are not concerns, they're just questions. Like if, if a parent says, why do I need to vaccinate my kid at age nine? They're not gonna be sexually active until they're married, until they're like 42. Um, that doesn't mean they're not gonna do it. It just means they have a question. And so you answer it. And so um, we have hours and hours of talks on, on how to do this and training, um, but those are some, you know, off the top of my head, start with being understanding, don't judge, get into a dialogue, answer their question directly, answer it in a simple way without getting into lots of data and statistics and long stories. Wonderful. And try again. If they leave the office and they decided not to get the vaccine, try it again the next time you see them. Yeah, exactly. And and I will add to your comment as well that we'd collaborated with CIC on some uh, topics about vaccine hesitancy and had some really great live Q and A. So there's also those resources mm -hmm. um, if you want to go watch and hear. You know, again, just reminders of some of these motivational interviewing strategies, some of the talking points, and helping parents build their confidence in, in the decision. So that's great. We've got um, some question here about going back, should you get Gardasil 9 if you had the first iteration of the vaccine? 
you need to be re-immunized? So um, if it's a boy, absolutely not. Um, because the male cancer, the oropharyngeal um, cancers, penile cancer, anal cancer, um, those are almost all the two types of age, caused by the two types of HPV that we're in Gardasil for. Um, so for girls, you're talking about increasing their protection from 70% to 90%. I can tell you both of my girls um, got the Gardasil 4 um, and I did not go back and get them vaccinated. Um, it's a personal choice. Uh, the CDC, ACIP does not comment on it. They didn't want to say yes or no. Um, so, uh, you know, at, at this point, Gardasil 9 has been around for a number of years. And so any kids who got Gardasil 4 on time uh, might be, you know, not sure how much protection they'd get. Um, but if people do decide to do this, I think just one dose of Gardasil 9, not, don't repeat the entire series. Um, but don't feel any urgency to get it and definitely don't get it for the boys. Um, if you think protecting a daughter against another 20% um, is, is worth getting another dose and you're, you're, the, the girl is you know, still in her teens, younger teens, mid-teens, um, personal decision. That's great. That's very helpful. I'm I'm in one of the original cohorts for it, so it's good to hear. <laughs> um, let's see. And I I uh, I'm just looking through some of our submitted questions, um, and there I'm seeing a lot that we've kind of, we've answered in some way, shape, or form, or have I think there are questions about where to find resources. And so what we'll definitely make sure to do is share the links that uh, Dr. Sazla has referenced along the way in her presentation because. There are fantastic resources for, I'm assuming many of us on this call work in this field, look for these strategies, share these strategies with partners. So we'll be sure to get those links out so you can really take a deep dive into um, all of the tools that have been assembled to aid in this effort. And I'm just looking through to see any other key questions that, um, there is a question about uh, the one dose. There's been some recent news about, mm -hmm. HPV vaccine efficacy with one dose. I think the UK is updating their um, policy and it may be preempted, but is there anything at this stage that you care to comment about as far as the two to three dose regimen? And are we, are we likely to see that change anytime soon in the US or not, not quite yet? It depends on your definition of anytime soon. Um, so I, I'd say two to three years. Um, the data are looking good. Uh, people are following the data, people in the United States, the ACIP, the CDC. Um, there is um, another big study that they're watching for in Costa Rica that will be wrapping up, I think, in another year or two. Um, and so um, WHO has um, made the switch. And um, what I'm, what I'm saying is one, wait, it is coming. And two, if you are a program that is, you know, I, I see a lot, of, um, a lot of programs that are either focusing on initiation or completion, focus on initiation if you're choosing between the two. Um, but otherwise, you know, if you're still giving that second dose or um, three doses after uh, the first one's given at 15. Keep doing that for now. It can't hurt. Um, I think the, the big question is duration of protection um, because we don't have data as far out as for as long um, for the one dose. So it's probably going to be okay, but um, let's wait another year or two until ACIP tells us what they think. That's wonderful. Okay. Well, thank you again, Dr. Sasso, and thank you for taking um, the wide gamut of questions, which HPV um, always requires because it, is, it touches so many different aspects of practice. Thank you very much. It's a really fantastic presentation. A lot of people are asking for the PowerPoint, so we'll follow up on that. Um, but I will now transition to make sure I introduce our uh, next speaker, who's one of my colleagues on our California HPV vaccination roundtable, Dr. Allison Herman. Uh, Dr. Herman is the Associate Director and she's a research scientist at uh, UCLA's Kaiser Permanente Center for Health Equity. 
UCLA's Healing School of Public Health, and she is the co-director of disparities and com for community outreach and engagement at UCLA's uh, Johnson Comprehensive Cancer Center. And so I'm very, very pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Herman, who several year colleague now in the round table to give us an update from the data work group. Okay, great. So thanks so much, Margo. Um, and it, I'm really happy to be here today. I'm going to go through um, relatively quickly an overview of the work we have been doing in uh, what we refer to as the data work group, formal name using and improving HPV vaccination data. Next slide, please. Okay, so I just want to acknowledge that this is a work group. So here we are showing all of our work group members, and this group is led by Hillary Gillette Walsh, and I believe she might even be on the, the meeting today. Um, the overarching goals of our work group, to get you a little familiar, is that we are really working to measure our progress towards our California HPV vaccination roundtable's goal of reaching 80% uh, coverage. Um, and we're working to assess and track vaccination by county um, and share that information. I'm going to share a little bit of that with you today um, and then inform stakeholders like yourselves. Um, so here's the most important thing I, I hope you take away from my few minutes today is that um, our roundtable is developing a report and um, this report is updated periodically so that we have the most up-to-date data available so you can look at where your county and your region stand in terms of vaccination and HPV attributable cancers. And the new addendum to the report was just released last month. So that is available at the Cal California HPV Roundtable website, and you just click on the report tab, and you can find the report there. I'll share a few snippets of things that you'll find in the report, but I really encourage you to go and access it on your own. Um, the data source for the report, so that we are all on the same page, is the California Immunization Registry, and we chose that data source for a number of reasons that you can see illustrated here. Um, there are pros and cons, of course, to any data source, and so the absolute rates that you see reported in our data may differ from rates that you see in other places, but we are quite confident that the relative differences that you can see between counties um, are, are quite accurate, and so you can see really where your county and your region falls in comparison to others in the state. Um, we are looking in terms of methodology at initiation and completion specifically among the 13-year-old cohort. Um, and this is, includes folks who have at least two total vaccine doses in the registry um, that are not COVID vaccine. So we um, are clear about which adolescents we are talking about here. So here, oops, um, did we miss one? Oh, okay. Um, so here we are, are, are looking at um, initiation and completion rates mapped out across the state, and you can see the darker colors are higher rates and the lighter colors are lower rates. So you can see where various counties and regions are, are falling in comparison with one another. Um, and again, if you access that report on your own, you can see um, this in table and chart form, as well as in, in this map form to see really where your county falls. So initiation spanning 33 to 72%, and then the completion spanning 12 to 47% um, across the various counties and regions. Then when we're, we're looking at opportunities for prevention, um, Something happened. A few of my slides seem to be missing, but I really do encourage you to go to the report. Um, when we're looking at opportunities for prevention, um, we want to look at where, where our county is falling, but we also want to look at that HPV attributable cancer incidence. So in addition to the vaccination initiation and completion rates, what is included in the report are HPV attributable cancer incidence by county. And here, when you look at the map on the right-hand side, the darker color is going to show the high cancer incidence. And we did this age adjusted and unadjusted. You can find them both in the report, but the higher incidence rates um, are in the darker color and then the lower incidence rates in the lighter colors. One of the key findings that we had when we were looking at the cancer incidence rates is that the rural counties 
across the board, every single rural county in the state of California is having higher cancer incidence rates than the statewide average. And we looked at two different time periods and we're seeing increasing incidence rates in those rural counties. So even more of a reason to push on the vaccination for those counties so we can protect populations as they're aging in the future. Um, at the end of the day, are we headed to 80% by 2026? Um, when we're looking just among 13-year-olds in the, in the registry, we're holding pretty steady. And that's actually good news because we didn't see that drop um, in vaccination rates that we saw in other vaccines uh, associated with COVID. And when we look in the NIS team data, we see that we're inching up slowly. So not perhaps as quickly as we would like, are we getting towards 80%, but we are getting there. So we need to just keep up the good fight and focus on these counties and regions that are having the lower rates um, to really get the, the overall statewide rate up there and get the most people protected against cancer. Um, and so where our work group will be going from here is working to disseminate the report um, really calling to action, again, a focus on rural areas. And we plan to do a new data update considering other data sources and trying to um, really call, pull together some information that we can share with you for specific population subgroups. So look forward to seeing that in the future. And that's my update for today. Um, thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, Dr. Herman. Wonderful uh, and such so important to have that data in hand for all of us who need to go back to organizations, right, and really show the use case. So it's it's critical that we are armed with with the facts. So thanks so much for highlighting this for us. Uh, last but by no means least, I'd like to introduce my co-chair for our parent and community work group, uh, Bridget Freely, who is the associate director of state partnerships. At the American Cancer Society, and she's also a coordinator on the California HPV Vaccination Roundtable. So, Bridget, uh, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you so much, Margot. And I can go ahead to the next slide. Um, so, thank you all for give, uh, giving me this time to provide this update about our California HPV Vaccine Week materials. And I also just want to say a huge thank you uh, to Dr. Saslow and Dr. Herman um, for those great presentations. And I know we only have a few minutes, so I'll keep this brief. But I know a lot of you are probably familiar with California HPV Vaccine Week, um, but I just wanted to provide an overview, reminder of what it is, and just some of our updated resources that we have available. So uh, California HPV Vaccine Week, um, for those of you who don't know, it's an annual campaign and it takes uh, place the full first week of August every year. And really the purpose of it is to increase awareness of the HPV vaccine as cancer prevention and its importance um, specifically uh, for adolescents between the ages of nine and 13. And this year it actually falls on August 6th through 12th. So we are well in the middle of it. And I just wanted to share some great resources um, that you can use to help promote it. So um, the, uh, the California HPV Roundtable's parent work group, um, which Margo and I are part of, um, we developed several resources just to help promote the week and the importance of the HPV vaccine. And this includes a social media toolkit. Um, we actually have stories from HPV-related cancer survivors, and we have both video and image assets available for each of these stories. We also have a campaign guide with newsletter and email content about the importance of HPV vaccination and additional external resources to help with your efforts. And you can find all this great content our group put together on our um, California HPV Roundtable website. Um, I did link it here, but I realize you can't click on the, the slide. So I'll pop that in the chat um, in just a moment. And I wanted to give just a little uh, overview of uh, like a snapshot of some of the resources that we have available. This isn't everything that we have available, but it's just, uh, I think it gives a good, a good sample. And I also wanna note too, that we do have um, social media posts available in both Spanish and Vietnamese as well. Oh, I'm sorry. So um, we do need your help promoting our materials, um, and there are really numerous ways that you can help uh, our efforts. Um, if you could share our social media toolkit and campaign guide with your organizations 
marketing and social media teams to use, that would be great. Um, please also follow us on Instagram and Facebook, our main social media channels, and please like and share the content that we post throughout the week and outside of the week as well. And we also understand that it, it is Tuesday, you know, we, the California HPV vaccine week is well underway so that you might not be able to use all of the content, but a lot of the social media content and um, email and newsletter content that we've provided can be used outside of California HPV vaccine week. So we'd really um, you know, love your help in promoting that. I did list my email here. I can also pop it in the chat as well, just in case you have any questions um, or have trouble accessing the materials. And just before I close out, I wanted to really give a huge shout out to our parent work group, um, especially Margo um, on our call today and Kim Woodstrichill, as well as everyone who helped. Um, and there was a, it was a huge team effort. Um, Maritza Gomez, ACS's marketing director, Paula Madison, Raquel Arias, Joyce Bareko, and Shantae Davis-Patterson. Um, it was just really a team effort. It took a lot of hard work to get all these resources up um, and running. So thank you all. And we hope that this will be helpful in your efforts to promote HPV vaccination in your community. So thank you all. I will pop these um, uh, the, the link to all the resources in the chat in just a moment, and I will pass it back to Margo. Thank you so much, Bridget. And I echo her thanks to the team that truly a team effort that secured and made and developed and really thought hard about the kinds of resources that were developed for this week. So I second that. And I really do hope that uh, those resources work for you this week, this month, this year. Um, we did really think a lot about how to make those more evergreen. So you can keep using them. You can keep sharing these stories, especially our patient stories, um, to make sure that you know, this week is HPV vaccine week, but HPV cancer prevention is a, a year round um, message that we're always trying to, to ring out. So thank you, Bridget. And thanks to the roundtable leadership for making this happen. Um, another big request and thank you is just to, if you could, if you have time, we'd love your feedback on this event, uh, you know, and more than just the event to what you're looking for, what you need, what you'd like to hear about in future presentations. Um, these are all really for you. It's, it's an opportunity to share the data that's being produced, share the resources that's being produced. So if there's something that you need and you're not seeing, you're not hearing about, please let us know. Um, and we'll continue to do our best to serve your efforts to make California HPV cancer free. Just a reminder too, the Immunization Coal California Immunization Coalition has a great YouTube channel. They are really uh, expedient at getting uh, these webinars up so that you can watch them later, you can share them with your colleagues, you can share them with leadership. Uh, so these messages continue to uh, be shared and resonate. So um, please check that out as well. You can always go to their website at immunizeca.org to get to many more resources and also learn about how you can be part of this co coalition and this effort. So a huge thank you to all our presenters today. Huge thank you to the California Immunization Coalition, ACS, and the roundtable, uh, the California HP Vaccination Roundtable for your leadership in putting this together. And we are making progress and we keep getting closer to making California HPV cancer free. So thank you for your help and hope you feel re-energized today and uh, continuing the work. So thank you all.